Welcome to the New Church Podcast. Father in heaven, thank you for this time when we get to listen to your word, be challenged by your word, to be comforted by your word. You know, Lord, this week, while I was preparing this message, while I was writing it and studying for it, all of the things in this message have been challenging for me. And so I pray for all my friends that are here this morning as they hear this message And as we go about our day and go about our week, that you would give them the strength to rise to the challenge that is before them as well. Amen. And you're thinking, that's not fair. (laughs) Uh, I love that song by the Civil Wars, Poison and Wine. I don't love you, but I always will. Your mouth is poison. Your mouth is wine. Your hands can heal. Your hands can bruise. It's a pretty accurate picture of complicated relationships. Where we love someone, we, we love them, but we also hurt them with our words and how we treat them. And you know, most relationships are at least a little bit complicated, right? One time I went to lunch with a group of people, and I didn't really want to go, which is a bit of a job hazard for a pastor sometimes. So all the way there, I'm thinking, I am going to make this the best lunch they've ever had. I'm going to just delight in them. I'm going to ask them questions. I'm going to be interested in their answers. I'm going to ask more questions. I'm going to laugh. I'm going to smile. I'm going to treat them like they're the most interesting people in the world, like they're a guest on The Tonight Show. And I'm Jimmy Fallon. I mean, it's good to have goals, right? (laughs) So I get there and they're already seated and they're already complaining about stuff. Not big stuff, just the usual things. So I think I can turn this around. I will find some clever way to ask a question that will lead the discussion in a positive direction, and I tried. After several attempts, I'm like, well, that didn't work. Try something else. I'll just take control of the conversation. I'll tell a funny story about something that happened recently to me. So I think of a story, and I tell the story and someone remarks on some negative aspect of what happened in the story that reminded them about something boring and terrible that happened to them recently. And their story, it's not funny, but at least it does take them a really long time to tell it. I keep trying to find ways to turn this conversation into something that doesn't make me want to shove screwdrivers into my eyes and ears. But they're much more committed to bumming me out than I am to cheering them up. So I just give up and eat all the bread and sit there thinking about how my appreciation for Jimmy Fallon has never been higher. I couldn't do it. I mean, I tried, but it just wasn't going to happen. Anything like that ever happen to anyone else? I was at lunch with my wife and daughter just the other day, and Vaughn was telling us a very complicated story about a conversation that she had with a friend. And my wife asked a question showing that she had misunderstood who Vaughn had been talking about, which was not a big deal, but I blurted out, really? And even as it came out of my mouth, I wish that I could grab that word and like stick it back in, just unsay it, delete, command Z. But no, it was too late. I saw it in her eyes. I had let Frank the Jerk basically call her stupid. Very uncool. Completely unwarranted, too. 
Kim just wasn't sure who Vaughn meant by she in a story where she wasn't using any proper nouns and she confused she with she, used losing track of which she she referred to the last time in the story she was telling. <laughs> really? So dumb. And when things like that happen, what you do next is what separates the men from the boys, the immature babies from actual mature adult Christians. Because you have a choice. You can ignore it and let it grow into resentment. You can dig in your heels and you can blame someone else. You can get upset because they're getting upset. Classic move. You can always make it worse. But I didn't do any of those things this time. Instead, I apologized immediately. Admitted it was a dumb thing for me to say that I was sorry. Kim accepted the apology, and the whole bump in the road lasted about five seconds. I hurt her feelings, noticed it, apologized, was forgiven, and we were back to trying to decipher our daughter's antecedents, like in no time at all. Well, tis the season for those kind of things, you know? The holidays, they are upon us. Maybe you got a jump start on super awkward conversation time over turkey and dressing on Thursday. Maybe you had high hopes for like just a peaceful meal with loved ones until a few disappointments <laughs> left you feeling grumpy and shoving dinner rolls into your mouth before you said something else you were going to regret. Or maybe other people were fantasizing about shoving things into your mouth to shut you up. <laughs> this is the last Sunday in November, the month of Thanksgiving. So I thought we'd have a little one-off message this morning about the thing most of us would say we're the most thankful for, the people we love, the people who love us. Now. We talk about law and gospel quite a bit around here. The law is what God expects us to do, his commandments, his wisdom, and the gospel is everything he does for us, especially through Jesus. So what about love? Is love law or gospel? For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son to save us. That's gospel, right? But love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the greatest commandment. And the second, just as important, love your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus says love is the whole point of the law. So which is it? Is it law or is it gospel? I mean, it's both, right? It depends on whether we're the ones receiving the love or the ones giving the love. Because when we're the ones who have to love someone else, well, then it's law. But when we're the one who's being loved by someone else, well, that's just pure gospel. And I think that's pretty interesting. But it always comes back to our understanding of what love is. Because what is love? We're not talking about the kind of love that we learn from romantic movies or love songs. We're not talking about the concept of love the way our culture understands it. Because our culture, it actually has love completely upside down. People think love is the way you feel about someone or something which is why you can love your mom and dad, but you can also love chocolate cake and football. People think they love something if it makes them feel a certain way, if it's something they want, if it's something they enjoy. But that is absolutely not what God means by love. Jesus is not telling you to feel a certain way about God or to feel a certain way about your neighbor. It's not about feelings at all. You can't promise 
to feel a certain way about anything. That's a, completely mis- that's a complete misunderstanding about everything God ever said. And that's a really big deal because a lot of churches, they spend way too much time trying to manipulate people's feelings, trying to drum up emotion, make people feel like they have to try and feel a certain way or they're not really worshiping. They're not doing it right. Now, I'm going to say all this, and some of you just can't hear me because you've been programmed so hard in the other direction. But listen to what I'm saying. The way we feel has nothing to do with love. God is telling us, he's commanding us to treat people a certain way, to act a certain way toward him even. It's not about the way you feel about it. It's not about feelings. Other than this, other than doing our best to control our feelings so we don't hurt people with our feelings, with our anger, our resentment, our sadness, even with our joy. Now, I'm not saying you can't feel love. When we love people, man, of course, we're going to feel it. But the feeling isn't what love is. The feeling is a byproduct. Okay, so 1 Corinthians 13 is called the love chapter. But it's not the lover's chapter. It's just as much about how we treat our family and our friends and strangers as it is about how we treat our lover. It's about how we're, when we're connected to Jesus by the Holy Spirit, however you want to think of this, when we're filled with the Spirit, when we're baptized, when we're born again, saved, redeemed, whichever of these phrases you want to run with, when you have the Father's name on you as an adopted child of God, when you're in the kingdom of God, part of God's family, when you're a Christian, see all these things, they kind of mean the same thing. Then he expects you to treat people a certain way to treat people with love. And then he tells us what love is. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 6. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So here's the question. Can you say any of those things about yourself? You say you love people. Do you love them like that? I mean, I sure can. I'll tell you what, man, because I am very patient with people. That's for sure, especially when I'm driving. And if there's one thing people say about me, it's that I am always kind. Kind is kind of my middle name. Also, I'm always happy for people when good things happen for them, but not me. Because I never envy their cool new job or their beautiful house, or how they still have a nice full head of hair. Nope, not me. I'm amazing at that. Also, I don't brag about anything because I'm not arrogant or rude because I'm better than you. I mean, humble is my other middle name. Plus, I'm generous. It's just part of how kind I am, really. I'm a giver. I never feel compelled to try and get my own way. I don't try to win arguments. (laughs) I know I already mentioned how patient I am, but seriously, I just never get irritated with people. Not when they make mouth noises while chewing, or click pens in meetings, or show up late, or spill a drink on my couch or in my car. Nope. I'm not irritable, and I'm certainly not resentful. I just can't seem to hold a grudge. You know what never crosses my mind? 
the people at my last job who took everything away from me that I'd worked so hard to build and kicked me out of the door same week my mom died. And those nightmares that I still have about it, see, those are clear proof that I have completely moved on in every way. I never rejoice at wrongdoing. I don't even fantasize about doing wrong things. I don't think about revenge or vindication. There has never been a single time when I felt like I was being treated disrespectfully and then started imagining how easy it would be to punch them in the throat, maybe smash their face on the counter, hold them by the neck, just hold them until they pass out. See, that kind of thing has never crossed my mind, ever. If I'm ever tempted to do anything wrong, I mean anything, even in my weakest moments, I take no pleasure in those temptations. I immediately just shut it down. And on the rare occasion that I might say something wrong in a conversation, I love when people correct me because I rejoice in the truth. I'm always like, thank you for interrupting my story to clarify that it actually happened at 3.15 on Thursday instead of 3.30 on Tuesday. Thank you for correcting me. What would I ever do without you? I effortlessly bear all pain, all setbacks, all snide remarks that people make under their breath. I'm just saying, I got this love thing down. Also, everything I just said, not. <laughs> no, it's ridiculous to even say it out loud. See, that's the struggle. We say we love people, but everything God says defines what love is, is really hard to do. And it's so easy to do whatever the opposite of love is, which is really just selfishness. Philippians chapter 2 verse 3 says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility... Value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. That's what God means when he says to love people. He also calls it mutual submission, laying down our lives for the people we love, and not just being willing to die for them, but also being willing to live for them, moment by moment. Living is a lot harder than dying. Jesus said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's what love looks like. Figuring out what someone wants and then just doing it for them. That 1 Corinthians passage, it's a great description of what it means to love, to be full of the Spirit of God and to love people. But most of the things in that list are stated in the negative. Do you notice that? What love isn't. Galatians 5.22 is a very similar verse, but it's all stated in the positive. And it works like this. If you are a saved follower of Jesus, then the Holy Spirit dwells in you. And if the Holy Spirit is planted in you, then there's going to be certain things that grow out of you. God calls this the fruit of the Spirit. And just like any fruit, the fruit is not for you. It's for others. Like apples on the apple tree, they're not for the tree. So this is a list of things that God is growing in you that you're supposed to give other people. So listen to this, Galatians 5.22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, the first word is love. But see, that's just the box that the rest of the fruit is packed in. Because all of these things are what it means to love someone. 
It means you're going to give them joy. <laughs> That's what you should be trying to do when you walk into a room, when you answer the phone, when you text someone, when you make small talk at the store, when you're sitting across the table from someone at a meal. You have to be deliberate. How can you give them joy? How are you uniquely wired to give away joy? Because my joy is going to look very different than your joy, which is good. It's not one size fits all. So how do you express joy? And how can you give it to other people? Just in general, don't be a dud, a gloomy Gus, an energy vampire. Don't be grumpy and mean irritable. Don't make jokes at other people's expense. Don't put people down. Don't say hurtful things. Don't encourage them to gossip about other people. Just get out of your own head and be the joy that you want to see in the world. That's part of what loving people is supposed to look like. Also peace. Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers. So make peace. Don't argue with people. And if you do end up in an argument, which is going to happen, then find a way to get back on track. Find a way to reconcile. This is what it means to love people. It means you're going to be patient with people, which is really hard. It means you're not going to snap at them. You're not going to make them feel stupid. It also applies to us when we're driving. Like, don't honk at people or make angry gestures, or aggressively pass them while glaring at them. Drive as if there are real, live, actual human beings in those shiny metal boxes. Drive as if other people are more important than you are. I've told some of you this before, but when I start to feel a little road rage coming on, and I'm by myself, what I do is I yell, me, which I think is funny because it's like, me, I'm mad at this other driver because they're inconveniencing me, they're in my way, and I'm being selfish, I'm being a baby, me, try it. We're supposed to be kind to people. You know, you really don't have to correct people online or in person. You can just let people be wrong. <laughs> I mean, sometimes the loving thing to do is to point out a dangerous error so you can like stop them from walking off a cliff or walking into a burning room or growing a mustache before they're 30. <laughs> Funny to me. <laughs> This is what loving people looks like. It looks like giving them joy, making peace, being patient, showing kindness, being good to people, being faithful to people, being gentle with people. That's how God wants us to treat people, all people, especially the ones who are really close to us, the ones we say we love. But see, none of that's going to happen without the last thing in that list. Self-control. Like, love is the first word. It's the box that contains the rest of them. But that last one, that's how we're actually going to put these things into action. you got to control yourself. Control your emotions. Self-control if you're going to be good to people. Control your anger, your anger and be gentle with people. Control your lust. And be faithful. Control your temper. Don't yell at your kids. Don't yell at your spouse. Don't snap at people. Treat them with kindness. Which is going to be hard. It's going to feel a little like death sometimes. <laughs> dying to yourself. Love is sacrifice. I was praying the Lord's Prayer the other day. And one of the lines struck me in a way that I hadn't really seen it before. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
I've always seen that line as a call to live out my faith and to be faithful, to be the person God called me out of the world to be. And all that is true. But all of a sudden, man, it just got a lot bigger. It got a little more glorious. Because I thought, how can we create heaven on earth? How can we treat people on earth the way people are treated in heaven? I mean, it's everything we've been talking about today. God's will is that we will love people. And when we do, we create these little pockets of heaven on earth when we do whatever we can to encourage people to live in the light instead of creating darkness with our words and our attitude, to live in joy instead of despair, to live in hope instead of discouragement, apathy, criticism, negativity, discontentment. When we do everything in our power to surround the people in our lives with love, controlling our words, controlling our actions toward them, man, that's just giving them a little taste of heaven on earth. I'm not talking about utopia because clearly we're not going to be perfect at it. Probably won't even be very good at it. But I started off this message talking about a couple of times when I wasn't able to pull it off just last week. Which is why this next part is so important. God is love. Which means he does all these things, all of it, perfectly toward you. Because it's who he is. God is love. He's infinitely patient with you. Supernaturally kind and gentle with you. He keeps no record of your wrongs. He loves you perfectly. You are completely forgiven for all the ways that you failed to treat the people in your life with love. You have a clean slate. You know what's good about a clean slate? You get to start over every day, fresh start, to love people the way God told you to. Jesus came down to earth. He showed us exactly what that's supposed to look like, what love looks like. And it's basically self-sacrifice. The night before he went to the cross, he said, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. And then he did. He laid down his life for you. And he said, beloved, a new commandment I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. Because when it comes right down to it, that's what love is. Love is sacrificing your life, your desires, your preferences, sacrificing all that for the people in your life, especially the ones you say you love. And that's what following Jesus is supposed to look like. It's what worshiping God looks like. He laid down his life for you, and now you're supposed to lay down your life for the people you love. I mean, yes, that means you should be willing to die for them. But more importantly, far more difficult to be willing to live for them. You know, when people say what they're thankful for, people almost always say the top thing on their list is the people they love. So I want you to picture those people. Picture the people you love. Who are the first ones that come to mind? Who's at the top of that list? Pray for God to give you the self-control to love them the way he told you to love them. To lay down your pride, control your emotions, and really love them. Pray for God to soften your heart and remind you 
of what it means to love them in those moments when you don't want to, in those moments when you (laughs) feel selfish, when your pride swells up, when things go a little sideways and you get angry, when you're irritable, when you're grumpy, when your stupid little heart is pushing so hard to make you act like a selfish baby instead of a person who wants to follow Jesus and live in his wisdom and love people. Pray for God to give you just a glimpse of what it could look like if you treated the people in your life the way he wants you to treat them on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. If these online resources have been meaningful to you, please consider going to newchurch.love slash give and show your support by helping make this ministry possible. Thank you.